morning, everyone, and welcome to the Meet the Candidates event for the State Supreme Court 4th Judicial District. All candidates on the ballot were invited. This event was organized by the League of Women Voters of Saratoga County and co-sponsored with the Adirondack Women's Bar Association. My name is Kathy Kobrick. I am a member of the League of Women Voters of Saratoga County, and I will be your moderator tonight. The Adirondack Women's Bar Association is a nonpartisan organization which promotes the advancement of the status of women in society and of women in the legal profession. It promotes the fair and equal administration of justice and acts as a unified voice for its members with respect to issues of statewide, national, and international significance to women generally and to women and attorneys in particular. The League of Women Voters of Saratoga County is also a nonpartisan organization. It's a volunteer political organization dedicated to the informed and responsible participation of citizens in government and not for women only. The League never supports or opposes any political candidate or party. That has been our policy since 1920. Membership is open to anyone who is eligible to register and vote whether you are male or female, or however you identify. Please consider joining our local league. As many voters are unfamiliar with the New York State court system, we are very pleased to have with us this evening, Douglas Gerhardt, a board member of the Adirondack Women's Bar Association, who will now give us some background on the state Supreme Court. Well, thank you, Kathleen. Very privileged to be here and uh, be here on behalf of the Adirondack Women's Bar. And although those viewing may say, well, you're, you're not a woman, <laughs> that's true. And the Adirondack Women's Bar is uh, advocates for women in the law and, and, and women in leadership. And, and that's something I've, I very, feel very strongly about and very proud to be a member of the, the Adirondack Women's Bar. So tonight we're here with candidates for the fourth judicial district of the, of the state Supreme Court. And just by way of introduction, the uh, I thought I'd provide all of the listeners with a little bit of a context for that. So the, the Supreme Court, let me start first with just the office itself. The Supreme Court itself is a, a trial court, unlike the US Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the federal system. The Supreme Court is a what's known as a court of original jurisdiction, it is a trial court. So depending upon the nature of your claim, whether it be civil or criminal, it may go to Supreme Court as the first stop at the in the court system. And then from the appellate division and ultimately to the New York Court's the highest court in the in the state system. So the general jurisdiction of the court is just that. It is general. It hears uh, civil and criminal matters. And while it, there's a there's a reasonable amount of, of civil, there's a there's a robust amount of, of criminal matters as well. So the candidates you'll hear from tonight will be hearing cases before them both in the seminal, civil and criminal sense. That is civil meaning people suing each other as well as criminal meaning the people of the state of New York versus XYZ. Um, in terms of uh, other courts, there are other courts lower than the Supreme Court. There might be county courts, city courts that might eventually have their cases appeal to the to the Supreme Court, but think of the Supreme Court as sort of the trial court, the first place you're going to go. As far as qualifications of the individuals you hear from tonight, under the New York State Constitution, uh, most judges in state courts are elected. That is the case here. Supreme Court justices must have been admitted to practice, must be admitted to practice law in the state of New York and practice for at least 10 years in order to qualify for the office they're now, now seeking. The term is 14 years. That is the person who will be elected will serve for 14 years. And, and that's a fairly common term in, in, in the court system in New York State. Uh, judges serve until age 70. There's a mandatory retirement age generally for judges of 70. There are many um, special circumstances and permissions that can be per permitted that, that often allow judges to serve longer than that. And, and I know from firsthand experience, several do. so. Um, the state constitution authorizes Supreme Court justices for each increment of 50,000 residents in a judicial district. In other words, 
there's a bunch of judicial districts in New York State. And they're all roughly, they should have about, about the same number of justices per 50,000 people. Interestingly, geographically, the fourth judicial district is the largest geographically in the state. It encompasses Clinton, Essex, Franklin, Fulton, Hamilton, Montgomery, St. Lawrence, Saratoga, Schenectady, Warren, and Washington counties. So it's a really big area. So there's a lot of judges in, there's 11 counties, uh, 14 justices serve in the fourth judicial district. So it is uh, the residents of those counties have the privilege of, of electing who they want to serve on the Supreme Court. And we have the uh, candidates here tonight. And with that, I will, I will turn it back, back to you. That's just sort of a thumbnail sketch. Um, I actually have a map of the state of New York that everyone can look at to give you a sense of where the judicial districts are. So the fourth is this big, big yellow one. So anybody who, who sees themselves in the big yellow one, that's where you are. And with that, I'll, I'll flip it back to you, Kathleen, and really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this really interesting and, and extremely important forum. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Douglas. I really appreciate that. Um, it's amazing that that takes up this big part of New York State. Um, uh, one thing before we start, Allison, I want to make sure that you have everybody on speaker view. A uh, gallery view, gallery view, I'm sorry, gallery view. Okay, before we start, I want to remind the candidates and our audience that the video taken tonight is the property of the league and only can be used by the league or licensed media according to FCC regulations. This event will be posted in its entirety. It may not be used by the candidate except to post a link to the complete video. We do not make this request lightly. We have had recent experiences where candidates or their supporters have used portions of our video or an audience member's own video against their opponents. The League is a nonpartisan organization and use of the video by a campaign specifically against another candidate goes against our purpose. Additionally, this behavior would discredit us with candidates, making it difficult for us to sponsor future forums. All candidates participating this evening have pledged that they will abide by our policy. Questions were sent to us by members of the community. They were reviewed by Mr. Gerhardt. While judicial candidates may participate in debates and forums with other judicial candidates, they must adhere to the rules governing judicial conduct. They must avoid making pledges or promises of conduct in office other than being faithful and impartial in their duties. They must avoid statements which commit or appear to commit them with respect to cases, controversies, or issues that they are likely to come before that are likely to come before the court. Thus, the candidates may decline to answer certain questions. We have timers for this evening's event. Cards will be held up for the candidates to glance at. Green means, and if you will hold them up, one minute. Yellow means 30 seconds. And, and red means your time is up. I'll allow you to finish your sentence, but then I will politely say time's up. Um, there are six candidates for three seats with 14 year terms. Our candidate, one candidate, Robert J. Kupferman declined and referred voters to his records. The other candidates in alphabetical or order are Judge Tanika Frost, Mrs. Allison McGahey, Judge Robert Muller, Mr. Chris Abstarzik, and um, Judge Vincent Versace. And uh, Judge Frost is running on the Democratic line. Um, Mrs. McGahey is running on the Republican and, and Republican and Conservative lines. Uh, Dr. Judge Robert Muller is running on the Democratic and conservative lines. Uh, Mr. Cripps Obstarzik is running on the Republican line. And Judge Vincent Versace is running on the Democratic and conservative lines. Um, now it is time to hear their two minute opening statements. They have drawn lots to determine their order. This first to speak will be Judge Frost. Thank you, um, Kathleen. 
uh, for being the moderator. I want to thank the League of Women Voters of Saratoga County for this wonderful opportunity to address uh, the public with regard to this important race. I also want to thank the uh, other co-sponsor, the Adirondack Women's Bar Association, uh, for participating in this important event. Um, I also want to thank those who are watching and who are uh, taking the time out to uh, understand the Supreme Court and um, get to know the candidates who are running for this, this race and um, for being engaged and informed. So my name is Tanika Frost, and I am a sitting city court judge in the city of Schenectady. I've been on that uh, court for uh, almost five years into this year. Will be I will be co completing five years on that bench. And um, as Schenectady City Court Judge, I've handled um, thousands of cases in the civil and criminal part, as well as um, conducting jury and bench trials. I've also um, been an administrative law judge for a state agency uh, for three years, and I practiced law uh, before getting on the bench for 15 years. I'm a fair, compassionate, and um, a person that listens to both sides on the bench. I'm calm under pressure. I, I treat people with respect and dignity. Finally, I consider myself a judicial leader. I've, I've started programs within the city court. One is called the UCAM program, a mentoring program for young offenders. And I'm also the co-chair of the Equal Justice in the uh, Courts Initiative. So I believe in uh, making sure that we have innovative, creative ways to solve problems within our court system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge Frost. The next to speak will be Judge Versace. Good evening. Uh, my name is Vincent Versace. I am a candidate for Justice of the Supreme Court for the 4th Judicial District. I also want to thank the League of Women, Women Voters and the Adirond Adirondack Women's Bar Association for hosting this wonderful event and Kathleen for taking the time out to, uh, to moderate this event. Um, I am currently the sitting Schenectady County Circuit Court Judge in Schenectady County. I've been in that position since 2010. Uh, simultaneously, I've also been designated as an acting Supreme Court Judge for most of the time that I've been sitting on the surrogate's bench since approximately January 1st of 2011. Uh, I balanced uh, the challenges of being the surrogate in one of the busiest, if not the busiest, Service Court and the 4th Judicial District with that of having a very active Supreme Court calendar in Schenectady and most recently in Saratoga counties. Um, it's been a, a challenge, but it, and it's been difficult. However, I think that I've demonstrated not only the capacity to be fair-minded and impartial in any matter that comes before me, but also been, uh, been qualified to handle any, uh, that I am qualified to handle any and all matters that may come before me if I were to be fortunate enough to become a Supreme Court Justice in the 4th Judicial District. Um, I, I say I'm qualified not only because of the matter of time that I've served, but I've demonstrated that I am uh, always prepared for any matter that may come before me. Um, I, I, I do my homework. Uh, I've been told that I call balls and strikes. Uh, I call them the way that I see them. Um, I, I'd like to try to bring, I'd like to think I bring common sense solutions to any of the complicated issues that come before me, not only as a surrogate, but as a Supreme Court judge. I intend, if I'm, again, have the privilege of being able to serve as Supreme Court justice for the 4th Judicial District to continue that. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judge Versace. And now we're going to hear from uh, Mr. Obstarzik. Thank you. Thank you, League and Adirondack Women's Bar Association for putting together this forum. Um, my name is Chris Obstarzik. I'm from Saratoga County. Um, I, a little bit of background about me. I uh, come from blue collar roots. My great grandfathers and grandfathers were factory workers that worked in steel mills. So the concept uh, and the character trait of um, hard work has been instilled in me from a very young age. Um, that's how I conduct my life. That's how I can practice law. That's how I conducted this campaign. And that's what I will do on the bench. 
Um, I live in Saratoga Springs with my wife and three daughters, uh, Ursula, Agatha, and Iris, 12, 10, and 8. They're very active in the community with sports and activities. In fact, I'm picking up my youngest daughter from hockey practice after we finish um, here this evening. I've been practicing law for 22 years. Um, I graduated um, with honors from Albany Law School. And after that, I clerked at the Appellate Division in Albany, working on uh, a range of appeals, writing proposed decisions for justices of the court, ranging from murder appeals the constitutional appeals and everything in between. Um, after that, I lived in New York City for several years and I worked in the largest medical malpractice defense firm in the country, representing doctors, hospitals, and nurses in complex medical malpractice actions. Um, I, I met my wife in New York and I moved um, back up to Saratoga. And um, throughout my career, 22 years, I've worked on a wide range of civil litigation cases from maritime litigation, product liability litigation, insurance litigation, real estate litigation, matrimonial litigation, medical malpractice litigation, custody and appeals, every component of a case that goes through the court from drafting a plate to taking depositions to meeting and retaining expert witnesses and to picking juries and trying cases. I've tried over a hundred cases in my career um, I've done and um, I think um, I'm well suited for this position and I'm looking forward to the opportunity um, on election day to uh, hopefully win. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Epstarzik. All right, um, uh, Judge Muller, it's your turn. Good evening. I'm uh, Judge Muller, and um, I, uh, I again, I thank you all for taking the opportunity to take uh, something like this and put it in a forum where the public can have the opportunity to take a look at what is a Supreme Court judge. Now, I'm running for re-election, so I have the pleasure of saying that I'm in my 14th year as a Supreme Court judge. And uh, over those many years, I have um, managed to issue over 8,000 decisions and orders. And um, I was described recently in the New York Law Journal article as a judge that's seldom reversed. Um, I am also a judge that is perhaps one of the most widely published judges in the state of New York. And what's the importance of that is that uh, the judges from around this state, the lawyers from around the state, the litigants around this state, they take a look at what goes on in my chambers for guidance on uh, how they can approach these different legal issues. I wanna just comment the, the, the size of the district. Um, I live in Lake George, that's where I am this evening. And uh, I am a 46er and I'm regularly up in the Adirondacks. And when you sit on the highest mountains in the state and you do a 360 degree view look, you see essentially the entire fourth judicial district. And uh, I am a North Country, I was a North Country lawyer. I consider myself a North Country judge. Um, and uh, I look forward to staying on. I do want to make a comment. Mr. Gerhardt talked about what the jurisdiction of the court is. Uh, the Supreme Court in this part of the state does not do any criminal law. And I have not done any criminal law. And I don't expect to ever do any criminal law. In my uh, years early on as a lawyer, I was an assistant district attorney in Warren County. That was my criminal experience. But at this point um, in my uh, uh, tenure, we do not do criminal law. And I also want to comment that the Supreme Court is the only court that would permit judges to remain after their 70th year. And there is a constitutional provision that permits that. So we're very unique in that regard, which is we don't leave Thank home at 70, or at, at 70. If there's a timer there, I'm not saying it, but I said Oh, um, but yeah, there was, um, are you on, it, there should be a stop sign. Uh, I'm sorry. Never, never, nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, thank you. Thank you very much. If you're on gallery view, that probably would help you um, up in the right-hand side of your um, corner. Okay. Of you. okay. Um, next, we're going to hear from Mrs. McKehy. McGehee. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, and hello to all the other candidates we've had a chance to meet on the campaign trail. Thank you for hosting this. I just want to take some time to introduce myself. My name is Allison McGahee. I'm from St. Lawrence County, where I grew up on my grandparents' apple orchard. In fact, for over 30 years, I worked that apple orchard every weekend while I was going to law school and while I, was, while I had been working as an attorney. 
Uh, I started out my career in headed towards law and law enforcement when I worked at a federal prison in Raybrook, New York. It was there that I decided to go off to Oswego County, at Oswego, SUNY Oswego, excuse me, to get my four-year degree. I took the trooper exam and I took the law school entrance exam at that time and got into both of them and I chose Albany Law. While I was at Albany Law, I, I had the opportunity to intern for then Supreme Court Justice Bud Malone, and that's where I developed the passion and the interest to someday serve my community as a Supreme Court Justice. After passing the bar, I was appointed by Governor Pataki to be the Deputy Director of Elections Operations and then Special Counsel at the State Board of Elections where I helped all 62 counties run their elections. In fact, for the last 10 years, in addition to running my own private practice, I also have been the election commissioner for Essex County. Uh, after I left the Board of Elections, I have been a prosecutor with the Essex County DA's office and I went into private practice for the past 10 years as well. I also felt going into private practice that it was my civic duty to help by taking on assigned counsel cases, helping litigants in family court and criminal matters who couldn't otherwise afford an attorney of their own. I'm proud to have served my community in public service for over 15 years, and I'm looking forward to this race. Thank you very much for this opportunity to meet you. Okay, thank you. Um, now it is time for questions. Candidates will have up to one and a half minutes to respond to questions. You are not required to respond. You may pass if you wish. You have two opportunities during the question and answer session to request an additional one minute to add to your response or to respond to something another candidate has said. Just hold up your hand and I will acknowledge your request. This time may not be used for your closing statement. The timer and I will keep track of the number of extra minutes used. Questions will be directed to candidates in rotation so that everyone gets a chance to respond. And I do ask you, if you do want to ask for an extra minute in your response, give me a moment to make sure the timer's added on so um, they'll give you the extra time. Um, can everybody see, can, timers, can you hold up those uh, signs again? Can the candidates see them now? I can't see a thing. Hmm. Um, you should be able in the top screen hand right hand screen of your um, computer, it should say view. If you click on that, you should be able to change it to gallery view. And that way you should be able to see them. Do you see um, that now? Thank you. Okay, very good. Sorry, we didn't take care of that earlier. All right. Um, so we're going to uh, start with Judge Frost again, you're going to get the first question. What improvements should be made within our court system to provide faster trials for all cases? Thank you for that question. Um, the, the number one thing that I would say to answer that question to have um, faster trials is something that I experience in city court now is to have the proper resources to um, handle the uh, amount of caseload that we do have. Schenectady City Court is one of the busiest courts in the Fourth Judicial District. And we currently have four judges and we're short one courtroom for the judge. And um, I believe that um, if we had that courtroom and we've been trying to work on that, uh, we meeting the Office of Court Administration and as well as um, um, the, the, the mayor where um, our offices are located to make sure we have that resource. But uh, I believe that um, also implementing um, ADR practices, um, alternative dispute resolution practices, getting some of the cases to um, uh, talk with one another and try to resolve them um, before getting to the trial will only leave those cases that really need to be heard in front of a, a jury or a, um, a judge in order to get a, a resolution. So those would be my, my two um, uh, thoughts with regard to improving um, the ability to have trial, trials in a, a, a more expedient fashion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Judge Frost. Um, Judge Versace? 
Uh, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, great question. The low hanging fruit or the easy answer is that uh, the some time ago, more than a decade ago, the court system implemented what's called a summary jury trial system, uh, where it's an alternative to a full blown jury trial. I've had the opportunity to conduct a couple of those. And it's an expedited system where there is a, a fast track jury selection. They, um, they, what they call stipulate in the evidence, much of the exhibits, they stipulate as far as uh, a number of the witnesses uh, who are going to testify, particularly experts. And it's a low cost efficient manner, uh, method of trying a jury trial. Um, <laughs> the other method or the, the best method as was alluded to by Judge Frost, is what's called a, a alternative dispute resolution, which is basically at the end of the day trying to sell the case, whether by mediation, mandatory arbitration, or what I try to do, I, I don't like to sub out my work, so to speak. So what I like to try to do is get people in for what is called an old-fashioned conference and try to roll up our sleeves and try to come up with a common sense solution amongst between the parties that the parties can agree to and the parties can that we help bring the parties to a solution that probably neither side is particularly fond of but it's a uh, we tried to foster a middle ground where the parties can live with the solution and uh and meet halfway so to speak thank you okay thank you very much uh, mr abstarzik thank you yeah so being a uh, practitioner and representing plaintiffs and defendants you know i obviously come across this issue with clients. And I think having a public, having a private sector mentality, I've been in private practice for 22 years. Um, you know, I, I think the issue is with the court system, the court system's in a nine to five box, right? And I think what the pandemic has showed us, there's ways that, you know, we can get around that, you know, with we're on a Zoom now. So there's nothing preventing judges. I think judges need to work harder and they should be conferencing more cases either um, before nine o'clock and after 5 p.m. where they don't need a stenographer. And this is this will give um, an opportunity to move more cases along um, so they're not relegated to that nine to five. So there, there's a way uh, we can move more cases by hearing more cases. And that's being outside of the context of the nine to five. And as um, with this technology, um, it can it can be done easily. So I would certainly um, welcome that idea to the court system. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Judge Muller? Well, thank you for the question. I um, want to say that in my um, years as a lawyer, I did nothing but try cases for a living. And I tried it in all 11 counties of this uh, fourth judicial district. And I built up a strong relationship with the legal profession over that career. And there isn't anything that I didn't see as a trial lawyer that I now see as a trial judge. Any person, any litigant is ever in front of me, there is no such thing as there's going to be delays in getting their trial. I thrive on trials. I, I, I admire the legal profession. I know how hard the attorneys work at it. And anyone in front of me that needs a trial, they get it. And they either get a non-jury trial or they get a, a jury trial. And I, I'll say that this comment about the summary jury trials, it's a wonderful idea. But my experience is that the lawyers are not terribly thrilled with it. And um, so I'll, I'll offer it like anything else, any other means. I'm a settling judge and in legal profession anywhere in this fourth judicial district, they know that. I will work as hard as I possibly can to get a settlement. And if I can't, they'll get their day in court and the jury or me, if it's non-jury, will give them the result they, uh, they need. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mrs. McGahee. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I haven't heard anything here that I've disagreed with. Uh, as a practicing attorney for almost 20 years, I can tell you that one thing that I've noticed is that there really is no substitute for in-person conferences. We switched to a lot of Zoom conferences, especially over COVID. And I've always found that the best way to settle cases and move them forward has always been to have the attorneys and the litigants in the room to have real discussions about the cases. It's, it seems to have, at least in my practice, always been the fastest and easiest way to resolve disputes. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next two questions are going to be about bail reform because that's kind of a hot topic right now. And um, 
Judge Versace, you're going to get to answer this question first. When we use bail for arrested people, it was the judge's choice to set bail at a certain amount. Now it is frequently the judge's decision to hold them in jail or release them to return to court later. How much discretion does a judge have in deciding this matter and what considera considerations factor into that decision making? Well, as you alluded to, there were significant changes in the bail system since I was city judge for eight years back from 2003 to 2010. So Judge Frost is, is better able to, uh, to answer this question because she's lived it uh, since bail reform went into effect probably about two years ago, if my memory serves me correctly. But um, under the current form, judges right now aren't, do not have the level of discretion they had under the former bail uh, system and under uh, the penal law. Um, we had a, a set of criteria we would look at and we can make a decision of whether or not that person was released on their own recognizance, cash bail, bond, or under some sort of supervised, uh, supervision. That's no longer the case. Uh, the current uh, bail uh, statute does not provide that in often cases you must release folks on their own recognizance. Um, I'm not as well versed in it because again, I have not sat in an arraignment part since 2010, but I know speaking to my friends in law enforcement and fellow judges that they felt a bit hamstrung about uh, some of the decisions that have been made. I cannot say for myself uh, that I've sat in that position. I don't know the criteria for what, uh, what crimes they're able to set bail and what, what ones they're not as I sit here now. But I'll tell you, my philosophy is that generally speaking, judges should be given the discretion they need to make the right decisions. Okay, thank you. Mr. Obstarzik? Yes, I, I agree with Vince, but also as Judge Muller alluded to, you know, this court, this Supreme Court in these counties does not deal with um, criminal cases. So these are not, um, bail issues are not something that would readily come before it. So I don't think it's appropriate for me to get into anything other than that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Judge Muller. Well, um, you're talking about something called the Bail Reform Act of 2020. It was reformed again in 2021. I'm sure something will happen to it in 2022. The only reason I have any familiarity with the Bail Reform Act is that I'm the chair of the bench book for trial judges that I think I mentioned. One of the chapters in there that I've edited is the criminal law chapter that describes in great painful detail the criteria for when someone is entitled to cash bail or not entitled to cash bail, whether the crimes involve deaths. I mean, I have a general familiarity with that. But again, since we don't work in the Supreme, the Supreme Court doesn't work in criminal law. What those of us who have can discuss is really just what we've heard and others application of it. I will say I am not a fan of any type of legislation anywhere that ties a judge's hands. We're here to use our intellect our education and our discretion and any any statute that interferes with that uh, is troublesome. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mrs. McGahey. Thank you. I am not a sitting justice at this moment. I am a practicing attorney. This question's more geared towards the judges and I'll defer to their answers. Thank okay. you. And uh, now to Judge Frost. Okay, so I guess I'm the only one that actually has implemented the changes to uh, bail reform. And what I will say that um, the just discretion of the judges, um, I, I, I wouldn't say it was <laughs> limited, but it was um, more tailored to uh, factors that include the real reason why we set bail, the real reason why we set bail is to assure that that person comes back to court when they are supposed to come back to court. And so bail reform has um, included a, a list of qualifying offenses, mostly felonies, violent felonies, um, and some misdemeanor cases that 
Um, you do have the, a discretion as a judge to set bail. You look at factors, whether that person has appeared before on, on cases, whether that person has a criminal history, whether that person actually lives in the area, um, and um, any other factors with regard to obeying court orders and things of that nature. So that is where the discretion comes in. There are some um, misdemeanor level crimes, particularly that the court does not have the ability to set bail. Um, and um, only when that person persistently and willfully misses court in those cases, will the court have some discretion in terms of uh, setting bail. We do have the um, discretion as well to set cash bail as well as what's called non-monetary conditions. And uh, the number one uh, tool we use for that is to have them released under the supervision of probation. So they are being monitored, even though they um, may not be um, actually uh, bail, cash bail set in, that, in those cases. Thank well, you. Thank you very much. That was um, interesting to hear. And because um, this is not part of your jurisdiction, I will not ask the next question about bail reform and we'll just move on. Um, so, uh, Mr. Obstarzik, um, you're going to get this question first. Do you believe there are changes? Oh, what role should DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives play in courts and court proceedings? And does this happen now? Yeah, thank you for the question. So I think um, as a judicial candidate, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on, on DEI issues because uh, those certainly um, could come before me on the bench and uh, it would be inappropriate and unethical for me to comment on that. Even what role they should play. All right. Um, we thought we checked these out. Um, Judge Muller, would you like to re answer that question? Well, sure, because it. Um, uh, I told you that I'm a writer. And uh, so we actually have to wrestle with the correct pronouns in the writing of our decisions in the writing of the treatise that I've talked about. I'll also tell you we have this uh, publication that's called the Pattern Jury Instructions, and the Pattern Jury Instructions is a tool that's used when we're instructing the jurors um, on how the law will be applied in the case. And there are now jury instructions that are tailored to uh, require the court to actually talk about that issue and, and to instruct the jurors, perhaps if they have some prejudices, they have to suppress those prejudices. They have to identify them first. So there are areas already that are, are embedded in our legal system where the issue actually is addressed. Um, uh, I'm always curious about the wrestling with what kind of a pronoun I get to use. And I did have a matter recently where the issue uh, before me didn't involve this, but the individual had a gender identity issue. And I had to be uh, instructed or warned by the clerical staff in the courtroom that uh, I better use the right pronoun. So we're sensitive to that. And we also do have mandatory diversity training in the court system. Um, and uh, we've had a couple of years of that. So it's not a foreign concept. Okay, thank you very much. Mrs. McGehee. I would agree that diversity is not a foreign concept to me either as a practicing attorney. For the past few years, it's been part of our continuing legal education credit requirements. And so I've received the training that's required pursuant to that. As far as in the court system, not being a judge yet, I can't comment on that, but only as a practicing attorney. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, judge Frost. Okay, so absolutely diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, is what we have to pay attention to as a judge and running our courtrooms. It is absolutely um, imperative that um, everyone that comes into our courtroom feels respected, that they are heard, that they are treated with dignity. And there was a report uh, by Secretary Jay Johnson that was commissioned by Chief uh, Judge De Fiore back in 2020 that found that there is bias and discrimination throughout our court system. And that's why I was uh, 
chosen to be co-chair of the Equal Justice in the Courts Initiative for the 4th Judicial District. And on that committee, we are addressing some of those issues that were found in the report and that are unique to the 4th Judicial District. One of the things that we are working on is access to justice, making sure that individuals who are not represented by counsel, um, pro se litigants are treated fairly by being able to navigate the system and understand what's going on. And we are also working on uh, initiatives to make sure when a person walks into a courtroom, that they're greeted by the court officers, they are treated with respect. We are working on indiv um, placing individual pictures and things of that nature that reflect the vast diversity of our court system. And so there's a lot of work to do in that regard. And it's incumbent upon each judge to make sure that they are paying attention to these issues because we do serve a, a wide variety and cross section of the community. And it's very important that everyone that steps into the courtroom feels respected and is treated with dignity. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Judge Versace. Yes, thank you. Fairness, impartiality, and the rule of law. I, I can't think of three larger concepts with respect to DEI. I, I think that they're implicit and I think they encompass all those issues. And that's something I work on each and every day to make sure that when people come into my courtroom, that they believe there is a level playing field. I think that speaks to all the issues and concepts of DEI. Do we have to do better? We absolutely have to do better. And I think what Judge Frost said with respect to the hard look that the judiciary took a look at itself and took a look at some of the issues that we're still facing even in 2022, I think we have a lot of work to do. That's why, um, as was uh, noted earlier, that we take this bias training. And it's amazing, uh, one of the best uh, projects and the best uh, products, I'll call it, that the court systems ever put together was a wonderful video uh, when the jurors come in and it talks about biases and the, the biases that we all have each and every day. The, the part of it's the process of our mind, but it's also the process of our environment. And these are the types of things that we have to uh, take out of our thinking when we're sitting as jurors. And that's the same thing we have to do as judges each and every day. We have to take those shortcuts that are called oftentimes and those uh, preconceived notions out of our mind and take a look and apply the facts to the law as we see them as they're presented to us. That's DEI, that's fairness, that's impartiality, and that's uh, the common sense solution that I think Thank I bring you. each and every day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, this question is going to go to you, Judge Muller, first. Putting aside the current process, do you think judges should be elected or appointed? If judges are appointed, who should they be appointed by? Well, I have lived by that sword of having to run for election. So I'm more of a fan for the election process than the appointed process. And quite honestly, when you're campaigning for election, in my case for re-election, you travel around the district, you meet the people who you propose that you will become involved in their lives. You get to understand their thought process, you get to understand the problems of their communities, and you, you absorb that process from Schenectady County to St. Lawrence County, uh, Ham Hamilton County will uh, uh, be voting for Supreme Court. There isn't a county that I don't set foot in just as when I practice law. Take all that away and put in its place an appointment process. Now, the appointment process by and large, has all of the holes of being partisan. And when you're running for judge, you're out there on a path that is nonpartisan. I consider my entire election process to be nonpartisan. Uh, I, I, as I say, I live and die by the sword that we elect. Many states do elect judges. The, the issue that this forum really crystallizes is that the people need to understand, they need to educate themselves as to who are these candidates? Because we have so much power over their lives that you choose and you choose carefully. And that's why I applaud the forum that we have here tonight to start that education process. Thank you. Great question. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, Mrs. McKay, Gahey, <laughs> sorry. No problem. <laughs> 
it's not an easy last name. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, as a longtime election commissioner working for the State Board of Elections, this is something that the people should decide. And it's incumbent upon us candidates to get out there, to meet the voters, to get our message across. This is a great forum to allow us to do that. Um, really, as Supreme Court justice candidates, we are so limited by the campaign ethics guidelines as to what we can talk about that. Really, it just comes down to background, our experiences and our credentials. And I've been traveling this entire 11 county district since about the end of January, maybe the beginning of February. I'm thrilled to meet with voters. I'm thrilled to talk about my background and tell them why I think I'm the best choice for this job. Thank you very much. Sounds like this forum was a good idea. Um, Judge Frost? Thank you. So I've been the um, product of both being um, appointed. And when I was um, appointed by Mayor McCarthy back in 2018 to um, the city court bench in Schenectady, and then I had to run for a 10 year term that same year and I got elected to the position. So um, being the recipient of both, I see pros and cons um, for uh, you know both sides. I think that um, one of the things that I appreciate about the elective process is um, as others said, you know, getting to know and getting to interact and meet individuals who are going to be um, uh, potentially before you as judges, when you get on a bench, there's not a lot you can do. Um, and it can be a little bit isolating um, in terms of um, not being able to do some of the things that you were able to do when you were not a judge. So that interaction with people, I, I'm a person that really likes people and, and I engage with people and I enjoy that process. So I do appreciate having to um, meet people and talk to people about your qualifications and the reason why you're running. But there is something to the appointed process. I'm not sure. I think um, as Judge Muller said, you, you have to sort of be connected uh, in order to um, get to a level where someone notices you. So the mayor or the um, governor in some, some instances. So that might be limiting to some individuals who may not have that opportunity to be um, in that type of company. Thank you. Uh, Judge Versace? I feel very strongly that the elective process is much fairer than appointed process because really the only manner or method in which you can appoint someone is really through uh, or by uh, political folks or people in political positions, whether it be a chief executive, like a governor, as Judge Frost said, a mayor. Um, those are inherently political folks and they're gonna appoint folks that, you know, they, they may look at their qualifications, they may not. So I think the most fair method is elective office as far as the judiciary is concerned. With that being said, I have a lot of thoughts on how the elective process for judges should be modified or reformed, but I probably shouldn't get into them here. But I do think that uh, elected, electing judges is a much more apolitical process, believe it or not, than the appointed process. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Obstarzik. Well, I would echo a sentiment. I, I agree that um, elected, electing judges is, is the better route. I mean, at the end of the day, you're a judge for all the people. And um, it's incumbent on us as candidates to meet as many people as we can. This is a diverse um, geographic um, district and it's di diverse with its people and diverse with political backgrounds. And it's important as a candidate to not just meet, you know, the people that uh, you may align with. And, you know, you got to get out of your comfort zone and meet meet everyone, because at the end of the day, you're a judge for all the people, and um, let the people decide, you know, who they want as their judges. Okay, thank you very much. So the next question is going to go to you first, Mrs. McGahey. Um, as an attorney, back when you were practicing, if um, this was before you were judges, um, have you ever had a conflict of interest arise? And if so, how did you resolve it? 
Um, so I am not a judge right now. I am still a practicing as an attorney, attorney. As an attorney, yeah. I, I don't think I have. I don't. I don't think I've had a conflict of interest case. I. I'm trying to think of one, and nothing's coming right to mind. So, I. I don't think it's happened. Okay, that's fine. Um, Judge Frost. I just want to clarify the question. Is it as when I was a practicing attorney or now as a judge? Well, I, yeah, practicing attorney really was the okay. question. Um, I can't think of any specific um, instance at this particular time, but I'm sure there's been uh, cases where um, I have had some kind of connection or interest in, in something. And, and I actually, you know, pay m very close attention to um, my own um, just value system in terms of having integrity. And um, if there was a case where there was a conflict of interest, conflict of interest, I definitely would have disclosed it to the appropriate parties and removed myself from the process. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Um, Judge Versace. I would think as a lawyer, I can't think of a particular anecdote or scenario where I had to recuse or, or get out of a case because of a conflict. I, I can't think of one like, but certainly issues like that come up uh, uh, as a sitting judge all the time. I, I just had a case recently because we're running for office and someone put on a, uh, a fundraiser for me. And what I had to do was I had to place on the record that this happened and make everybody aware of it, the parties and the other attorneys, there was multiple attorneys, multiple parties involved. I noted for the record, uh, everyone said, no, judge, we think you can be fair and impartial, no big deal. And we moved on. So I can't think of a time, I mean, as an, a practicing attorney, obviously uh, that's something you have conflict checks happen all the time. I remember at one point for a short period of time, I was a city judge and a practicing attorney. I could not practice in obviously in city court. So those issues would come up all the time. And I also could not practice in a uh, local contiguous town courts where the attorney, excuse me, the judge was also an attorney. So those types of issues came up as a sitting judge, I'm assuming as, as a uh, practicing attorney, but as a sitting judge, recusal issues come up quite a bit. We have to place in the record, we have to document it. And if the parties, if it's a must recuse situation, the parties have to, it's what is called subject to remittal. Some of them are must, there's no way around it. So I think that covers kind of both as a judge and a practicing attorney. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Obstarzik, I guess you could do yeah, it hypothetically too, if, if you were a judge, what you would do. No, as a, as a private um, practitioner um, and some of the work with doing some criminal and family court work, I've had um, instances, um, I've had lots of conflicts um, and one is being assigned counsel. Um, you know, you do a conflict check and I could have represented a mother eight years ago and then today I get the father. And obviously I can't represent both, but on a on abuse cases where sometimes a family court will represent children. And I'll give you one instance where um, the abuse petitions brought against the mother and father. And some of the allegations are that the parents failed to properly supervise the children. And in this instance, um, the, the siblings were having sexual contact with each other. And I was assigned to represent both children. So in that instance, obviously, I could not represent both children. Um, and it, it comes in whether I met, met with both of the children before um, um, these disclosures were made. Um, and if I only met with one of the child, I can, I can still represent the one child. Uh, but if I represented both the children, I would have to get, I would have to recuse myself from the entire case because I would have privileged information and learning from both clients. So uh, this is something that, you know, it comes, you know, I, I, I often see this in my practice, so. Um, I think we're all learning a lot here today. Uh, Judge Muller? Well, your question asks me to reach in deep, far back into my career as an attorney. Um, and uh, whether, uh, how, if I had conflicts of some kind and how I dealt with them. I don't think I had any, because as an attorney, we're governed by a whole set of rules. I still consider myself an attorney. And those rules govern who uh, can represent and who cannot represent people. And so the rules that govern the conduct of attorneys, which I'm well acquainted with, because I have to work with it on a daily basis still to this day, 
it's looked at in the light of the client has a sacred right to select whomever they wish to be their attorney. And that sacred right is balanced upon uh, uh, against the possibility that there may be an attorney involved in that case that has private information, confidential information that they gathered from a prior relationship, and they've got to get out of that case. I've ordered people out of that case. And whenever I've done it, and I've done it very rarely, I've balanced against what I believe is that sacred right that you get to be represented by the attorney of your choice. When I've made those kinds of rulings, the appellate court um, has agreed with me, but it's an unpleasant endeavor to have to do that to any attorney. Thank you. Great question. Yeah, thank you very much. These are great answers. Um, so- Kathleen, can I interrupt one second? Yes. Although Zoom has a lot of advantages, one disadvantage is I'm home alone. I have a dog that needs to be let out. Can I let my dog out? Just jump off the screen for one moment. Yeah, because um, the next question is going to go to Judge Frost. So tell your okay, dog. That's to all. I'm not being disrespectful. I'm just going to go out. I'll be off back in 30 seconds. What's your dog's yeah. name, Vince? J Jerry. He's 20 right. years old, believe it or oh, not. Oh, gosh. Right. We're, we're, we're going go. for the Hurry. record 22 years for 12, by the way. So. Well, don't wait another minute. <laughs> just one moment. <laughs> Okay. Um, all right. Sorry. We're taking a dog break. Um, Monica, do you think we should just hold up for a second? Okay. The next question is going to go to Judge Frost first. How would you handle a lawyer who appears before you acting aggressively and disrespectfully to the court? And feel free to define that as you wish. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I have the privilege of, um, working with, um, a number of, uh, attorneys on both sides of matters in my courtroom. And I will say the majority are very, very professional and very respectful and have a great level of decorum for, um, the courtroom. But I have had occasion where, um, uh, the interaction, I guess, kind of uh, gotten a little spirited um, amongst the um, opposing sides. And um, my my role is to make sure I, I maintain that decorum in the courtroom and the respect. Um, and particularly if you're attorneys, you are uh, officers of the court. And it is very, very important to um, uh, model good behavior in the courtroom. So um, I will call a sidebar to address the issue. Um, and I might even speak to the attorney or attorneys um, privately in my chambers to address um, the behavior. Okay, thank you. Uh, Judge Versace? It's a great question. I, I'm just trying to think anecdotally. I can't remember a lot of times where at least I felt that an attorney was getting aggressive with me while I was on the bench. I mean, attorneys get frustrated. I call it getting a little chippy. Uh, it's usually uh, directed towards their adversary. In that situation, I won't, you know, I won't embarrass anyone, uh, particularly in front of the clients. I may call either a sidebar or call in the chamber saying, listen, the manner in which you're acting towards your uh, uh, opposition or your adversary is not, um, is not uh, respectful, is not um, appropriate. And if I say anything else like that, you know, th there's going to be a sanction or other punishment, uh, or I, I, I may embarrass you in front of your uh, your client, and that usually takes care of it. Um, you know, sometimes things get heated in courtrooms. I mean, uh, my father used to call it the forum. You know, you, you're 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 a gladiator in a battlefield sometimes, and that's the way that these lawyers think of themselves as being advocates for their clients and they're strenuously advocating for their clients. So sometimes they get heated, but I never take it personally. Um, it doesn't happen. Sure it does. But, you know, that's where courtroom control comes in. If the attorneys respect you, you're not going to get that attitude too often. You know, somebody might get a little heated. Sometimes you have to take a little break or let them take a break or have a sidebar, a little discussion. But nine times out of 10, they settle right down. So I, I haven't had, really had that problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Obstarzik. 
Obviously, I'm not a sitting judge, but um, in some of the practice I've done, I've seen issues arise um, often, um, as Vince alluded to, you know, attorneys are zealous advocates. And some of these cases, um, if you're dealing with a custody case and it's you're dealing with children, it, it becomes emotional. And these, these attorneys are, you know, they're vested in the process and, you know, they're doing their best that they can. And sometimes, you know, they get close to the line. But I think where I have seen it um, become issue is where the judge does not have the respect of the litigants. Um, if, you, if you, if the judge respects, if the litigants respect the judge, that behavior is not going to um, cross the line. Uh, but I agree with um, both Vince and Tanika that um, oftentimes it is a good idea to get the litigants out of the courtroom and have a conversation, maybe calm the attorney down, um, and then you know, re you know, come back to the courtroom and then proceed with the uh, the litigation. Okay, thank you, uh, Judge Muller. Well, many people never set foot in a courtroom, and if they would set foot in a courtroom, they would recognize it that it almost appears to be a cathedral. We have the flags, we have in God we trust behind us, and there's a lot of respect that just emanates from the room itself. And I think that that goes a long way to uh, temper any of the, uh, uh, the antagonism or the battling that goes on. I have to say again, because I tried cases for a living and I've watched it now all of these years on the bench. When I see the lawyers battling, they're battling with each other because there's an old maxim that if you have nothing else that you can try to prevent, to advance your case, you put the other lawyer on trial. I have maintained a sense of humor over my career. I know what's going on and I just pull them aside. I would never ever embarrass a lawyer in front of his client. It is probably one of the most unholy things that you could ever do. And there are lawyers that need to be embarrassed. I'll say in oral arguments sometimes when I know that the lawyer has no idea what my question is, I let him go. And my uh, mentors over the years have complimented me on the catch and release program rather than embarrass them. It's, it's not our role to embarrass these people. They work hard. They, they look beat up. They're tired. They've got clients. They've got overhead issues. They've got office issues. And that's what they come to court with. And they have a client at the same time. So uh, that's the best that I can say that I've seen it. I, I get a lot of respect out of my court, but I've earned it. And the lawyers that appear in front of me, they know that too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mrs. McGahey. I can't answer this question as a judge. I can answer it as an attorney. And well, it's a hypothetical question. Yeah, no, but you know, I, I have to say that I am very happy to report that in almost 20 years of practice in town courts, village courts, city courts, criminal courts, as a prosecutor, as a defense attorney, this is not something that you see. Uh, the, the North Country Bar that I practice in, it's, it's a great group of professionals. And honestly, I've always adhered by the, uh, by the policy that if you are prepared, if you know the facts of your case, if you are solid on the law, why would you need to yell? Um, also, I would just say that I'm the oldest of six children and I've got two of my own. My patience has no boundaries. <laughs> you cannot rattle me. And so uh, I've had nothing but good experiences in court. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, this next question is going to Judge Versace first. Did you ever engage in pro bono work as an attorney? And if so, can you explain what type of work that was? Uh, being a member of the Skagit County Bar, we used to, I don't know if we're still doing it currently, but we, we used to annually have um, free clinics uh, throughout the city, uh, have people uh, help uh, people fill out paperwork or forms or petitions, whether it be, uh, for example, surrogate score, for instance, uh, small claims, uh, those, or uh, be a referral source. I, I did do some uh, pro bono work. Um, people come in quite, it wasn't through a program, but sometimes just folks just did not have the resources and they were going to name from a family friend or 
our, our colleague and they would come. And if I, I thought uh, it was a situation where I could help them, I would, I would do a pro bono. But a lot of times it was a volunteer, but oftentimes it would also be more organized through the Skanky County Bar Association uh, prior to becoming a judge. Once you become a judge, you cannot do pro bono work. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Obstarzik. Yeah, I, I've handled, uh, I've done hundreds of hours of pro bono work. Um, a lot of it is, um, as Vince alluded to, if as a private practitioner it comes in and, you know, you want to do a divorce case or a custody case and, um, you know, they just don't have the resources. You know, you have these single moms who come in and, um, you know, if they, they go down the street, they're going to get a, you know, a $10,000 retainer and, um, you know, someone's going to quote them and, you know, they can't afford that. And, you know, I've done cases for, you know, um, where, you, you know people and you just know they're not going to be able to afford this and um, you know you do the right thing and uh, you represent them and you know you go through the system and um, you know you get a positive result for them and you know at the end of the day you save them some money which for a single mom you know that means a lot thousands of dollars that's going to go elsewhere to feed their children or have them play sports or or whatnot okay thank you uh judge Mahler. well the nature of the practice of law is uh, such in the uh, communities where I practice law that I might not have set out to do pro bono work, but I realized that's exactly what it became because as others have said, these people just don't have the means and I have the skill and I have the ability and I, I would not uh, refuse to share it. Um, th these are sad, sad encounters with people that have serious legal problems and no way around them. I, somewhere earlier in my career, I did... Uh, take a murder case to a verdict. I wasn't paid anything for that trial. Um, that individual was acquitted and that was about a three week adventure. Um, but, but what I wanna comment about pro bono from the position that I'm in now, I see these people who really need counsel. We don't have a mechanism to provide them counsel in divorce cases. For example, there is a, a weak mechanism to perhaps get attorneys to represent them. And I've got on the phone, and call people that I know are skillful in this area and tell them, you're about to get a pro bono assignment from me. And they take it because we're very fortunate. We, we have, we were highly educated. We, we've had good careers. I have a good career as a judge. And I don't begrudge anybody the opportunity to try to share that skill and that talent to help somebody who's never going to help themselves otherwise. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, Mrs. McGehee. Sorry, trying to unmute here. You know, I, I I echo a lot of what I've heard already. There are many times that we take on cancer cases where we know that the client doesn't have the means to pay us, and you just you do it anyways. Additionally, like I said at the at the outset, when I went into private practice, I recognized that Essex County has a huge amount of assigned counsel cases in family court and in criminal court with clients who need representation who can't afford it and not enough t attorneys in the North Country to handle that need. I've been in family court where the assigned counsel um, are coming from Saratoga County, from Warren County to come up to Essex County and help us out. I could not sit there and allow that to happen. So 10 years ago, when I went into private practice, I put my name right on the assigned counsel case uh, list and said, send them to me. I'll take whatever I can. Thank you. Judge Frost. Yes. So I have also participated in, um, pro se matrimonial cases with the Schenectady County Bar Association helping um, pro se litigants um, fill out applications to get um, a divorce. I've also, I, I was employed by Legal Aid Society of Northeastern New York doing um, housing and public benefits. Um, but once I left that, that organization, I um, was one of their pro bono attorneys and I continue to take on cases um, um, from uh, the Legal Aid Society dealing with protecting, um, uh, safeguarding public housing and also um, public benefits. In addition, when I was in private practice, um, I did take on um, pro bono cases as well, mostly with not-for-profit organizations and community organizations. 
organizations, pro bono cases, there are a lot of individuals who are not able to afford um, the services uh, as lawyers um, at times can be pretty expensive and uh, being uh, able to get, uh, thank you. Okay, I think that you're having a little bit of a connectivity problem. So you might wanna check, make sure you're all plugged in. Um, okay. So um, the next, this is gonna be our last question. I had some other ones, but you all really kind of answered those in your opening statements about your, you know, where you come from and all of that stuff, what you've done. So this is gonna be the last question before our closing statements. And um, Mr. Obstarzik, you're going to get this last question first. What are the five most recent significant non-litigation legal representations you've had? This question does not seek client names or any confidential information. Can you repeat the question? Yes. What are the five most recent significant non-litigation legal representations you've had? Kate, can I ask a question before Chris jumps in? Uh, three of us can't answer that question. Yeah, that's true. Um, Douglas Gerhardt, you can be our expert here if you're there. I don't know if he's listening. Um, I mean, I can answer that in the sense that I only do litigation. So um, I'm 100% exclusively devoted to litigation. So um, I can't okay, really come uh, up. You can go ahead on because so, there are some have been some questions that only the judges really had experience. Yeah, that's fine. We can move if you want to move on. That's fine. No, that's okay. You can answer the question. Yeah, so I mean, I'm uh, in my practice, I'm 100% exclusively devoted to litigation, so I, I can't give you five. Non oh, non-litigation. Right, right. Got it. Got it. So I guess um, we tried to take questions from the audience, from the, um, you know, from the community, and some of these questions just weren't appropriate. We thought we vetted them all. So I guess it's time for our closing statements. Um, Candidates, you have no more than one minute each, and we're just going to continue on with this grid. So I'll let um, Mr. Obstarsik go first. So I think it's important to have judges um, who have practical real world experience. That's exactly what I have. Um, when you're a judge, you're a judge for all the people. And for the last 22 years, I have been representing a broad cross section of the community. I have represented poor people. I've represented rich people. I've represented working moms, working parents, municipalities. I've represented small businesses, large corporations. I've represented marginalized members of society. I've represented people of color. I've represented people with substance abuse issues, people with mental health issues. And I think this gives me a keen understanding of what the people's experiences and expectations are of the justice system. And I can bring that experience. And I think that will be that experience will be a welcome addition to the bench here. Okay, thank you very much. Judge Muller. Well, let me say that in the 500 plus decisions that I have published over my career, that I can't think of an issue that I haven't already seen. And so when you get around to another one that looks familiar, you've been there before, I got a wide advantage on how I'm going to handle the case that comes in front of me at that point in time. I enormously enjoy this work. And again, I, I have many years to continue to serve in this capacity as a Supreme Court judge. Uh, I work in all of the counties that I can get assignments in over my career, and I continue to do that. And I just want to thank you for this forum because I'm the strongest advocate of getting the public to understand what is a Supreme Court judge what is an election for a Supreme Court judge? Wonderful format that you presented tonight and you get all of my compliments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mrs. McGehee. Thank you very much. Um, I didn't get a chance to tell you why I'm running for this seat. In 2008, Essex County lost its seat. That was 14 years ago. And since that time, we have not had a seated Essex County resident in that position. Essex County is geographically uh, 
the second largest, well, the third largest county in this for 11 county judicial district. And it's important that the people who live there have a judge who understands their unique needs and issues. In addition, I just wanna mention, this would be historic. There has never been a woman elected as a Supreme Court justice from the Adirondack Park. And I would be grateful for the support of the voters in this election. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Okay, thank you, Judge Frost. Thank you. Um, I want to again thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Um, it's been um, fun discussing these issues with the other candidates and um, I want to thank the other candidates for being here tonight as well. So in, in closing, I, I, I just want to reiterate that I have a vast amount of experience on city court and that I'm willing to bring to the state Supreme Court. I also bring a fresh perspective um, I didn't talk a little a lot about my background, but I was born and raised in Albany. I grew up in Arbor Hill in the South End. Um, I am the first person in my family to graduate from college. I'm the first professional in my family. Um, and I was the first African-American um, elected as judge in the city of Schenectady. And um, I will bring that fresh perspective to the uh, Supreme Court as well. There's not been a um, person of color who has um, been in a position to even um, run for this office here in the fourth judicial district. And so talking about history, it will be uh, definitely a historic uh, moment if I am able to be elected and with your support. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Judge Versace. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here and speak to all the folks out there uh, listening tonight and in the future. Uh, these are serious times and these are incredibly important uh, positions that we're running for. Um, and they're going to be more and more important as time goes on. As we, what, what we've seen, uh, people are, are oftentimes dissatisfied with what's happening, not only in Albany, but in Washington. And a lot of these issues are being pushed from Washington, D.C. and the federal government into the state realm. So the 14 people that are going to be sitting on the Supreme Court for the 4th Judicial District just might be deciding cases that are not only of statewide significance, or for that matter, the people that are exactly in front of us, but have national significance. So in November 8th, it's going to be all of your time to be the judge. Who has the qualifications, experience, and the uh, capacity to be fair-minded and impartial? Who's shown that? Who's demonstrated that? over their experiences, uh, uh, judges or lawyers. You all have to do a deep dive into the credentialing experience of each one of us and make a serious decision on November 8th. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all of your answers were excellent. It was so nice to have you all here and for the, can the voters to get to meet all of you candidates. Um, um, audience, please remember to vote, and candidates too, on uh, Tuesday, November 8th. Polls will open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Early voting begins on Saturday, October 29th, and ends on Sunday, November 6th. Please check with your local Board of Elections for your polling place. Sample ballots are available on their website. And be sure to remember to turn your ballot over to vote on the proposal. You can also turn to the League of Women Voters Saratoga County um, website and um, www.lwvsaratoga.org and you can find out about all the candidates and their backgrounds because they've answered some questions online for us. Um, thank you candidates for attending this event and helping to educate the voters and thank you audience for taking the time to learn about the candidates. Good evening. And Kathleen. Kathleen, thank you for from the Adirondack Women's Bar. Very much appreciate you hosting this. This is a great forum. We uh, learned a lot about the candidates and just wanted to express my, our, my thanks on behalf of the Adirondack Women's Bar. Thanks very much. Oh, and, and thank you, Douglas. Um, your um, intro was very important, very good. And we thank the uh, Adirondack Women's Bar Association for partnering with us also. So good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.